That should be a sign of the rookie mistake that I'm about to make. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Bloody Hacks. Got an awesome project for you today. Something you may not know about me is that I love steam power. I'm obsessed with steam engines of all shapes and sizes. Steam engines are the reason I got interested in machining. I got sucked into YouTube and all the rest of this, but all I ever wanted to do was build, repair, and maintain steam engines of all shapes and sizes. So today I'm finally going to have a little bit of steam content on my ostensibly steam engine channel that I've never shown steam engines on. Uh, and that's a collaboration with the awesome Keith Rucker over at Vintage Machinery. If you watch my channel, I'm sure you watch his. And uh, he's been doing this awesome restoration of a steam stoker engine. And I met him at the Good of the Land Festival. He mentioned he was looking for some YouTubers to help him make parts for that engine. And I volunteered and I was like, heck yeah, I want to make some parts for a steam engine from 1930. So let's go. I really botched that take at the end. Let's just leave it in. It's a million degrees in here. My glasses are fogging up. I don't want to record that again. This is the Nashville Chattanooga and St. Louis number 576. It's a 484J3 class mainline steam locomotive built during World War II. And it's being restored by the Nashville Steam Preservation Society. And what we are working on is this little guy. This is a steam stoker engine. And what this does is it lives in the tender and it takes steam from the main boiler and then drives an auger, which ships coal directly into the firebox. Those big mainline steam locomotives use a lot of coal. And so this thing is basically a mechanical fireman and Keith Rucker is in the process of restoring it. And what you can see there are the crosshead guide bars. And you can see the sorry condition that they are in and the old ones were just not usable. So uh, Keith suggested that maybe I could make him new ones and that's what we're gonna do. So these are gonna be made from 1018 mild steel. And this is really a story of not so much making some parts because these are pretty straightforward parts. They are rectangular bars with some holes in them. But uh, this is really a story of working at the limits of your machine because remember, I have very small machine tools. So this would be a very straightforward job on a Bridgeport, but I'm working right at the limits of my little hobby mill here. So those are going to have to be replaced, I'm sure. Oh, that's my cue. Let's get busy. It's going to take some clever setup and some experimentation to hold the tolerances and get good finishes on these parts. Here's the original drawing for this part from 1930, and luckily for us, the tolerances on it are very generous. We just need to hold about 10 thou and everything, and so I will be able to do that on my little mill. So uh, here's the steel I'm going to use from a McMaster car, and this is a lot of steel. This is by far the biggest set of parts I've ever made in my little shop, and so that massive piece of steel is just half of it. Here's the rest of it. To give you some perspective, these two pieces of steel, I believe, weigh more than the table on my mill. So that gives you a sense of how hard I'm going to be pushing this machine to make these parts. Cut these guys roughly to length on the horizontal bandsaw. Our final desired length is 14 inches for each bar, and we need four of them. And note that I'm using my hydraulic lift cart to support the back end of this work, because once that saw finishes the cut, the back end of this saw is very suddenly going to get a lot heavier than the front end of this saw, and well, physics is going to happen, and you won't like that. And so begins the first of many experiments with setup on this project. I thought I'd start with the vise to see if I could get away with it because it was going to be a lot easier if I could. So I put it in the vise and set up some machinist jacks on the end and then took a stab at facing off one of the wider sides. And this is a uh, 10 flute shell mill that I've used many times on my channel, but uh, it is kind of dull and I suspected it wasn't going to be up to this entire job. It uh, made a pass, but the surface finish was pretty terrible. So it seemed clear that this cutter was not going to get it done for me. So then I thought, well, maybe I can rough cut with that and I'll do a fly cutter finish uh, after the fact to make them look nice. So I set up my fly cutter here for the three inch width of this stock and did a pass on this guy. And these parts are so big that applying cutting oil is like painting a fence. Finish here is pretty good, not as excellent as fly cutting usually is, and I suspect that's down to rigidity in my setup. And you can see how the quality of the finish changes as it enters and leaves the vise. So that was the first sign that this setup was probably not going to work, but I thought I'd uh, take a shot at doing the edges while I'm here before I commit to taking the vise off the table. 
And so I used this uh, Niagara cutter that I've had very good luck with in the past. It's not quite wide enough to do this in one pass, so I did two just to see if I could get a good finish on this edge. The finish on that edge came out outstanding, really, really nice actually. So I did some deburring here just to get a closer look at things, and yeah, I'm really happy with that edge. So that'll be the way that I finish the edges, but I have a lot of material to remove from those edges, so I don't want to have to do two passes on each. So I set it up though once again on one of the flat sides, and I wanted to experiment with the fly cutter a little more because my finish was okay, but not great. So I did another pass, this time with a little higher RPM and a slower feed. And I am getting some double cutting there on the backstroke. I think that's probably, again, down to rigidity issues with the setup. But actually, this time around, the finish was really, really excellent. I'm very happy with that. So this should be a good way to finish these parts. But I still have a ton of material to remove. I've got half an inch on the short edges that has to come off and about a quarter of an inch on the large sides that has to come off. That's a ton of material to remove. In this shot, you can really see how the characteristic of the finish changes at the entry point to the vise. So this is a sign that my rigidity is inconsistent here on this setup, and this is not going to be very good. So it was clear I was going to need a special cutter for this job. So. I went to Niagara's website and I found this guy. So this is a two inch roughing mill with a three quarter inch shank on it. Quite an unusual cutter. It doesn't come in a finishing version, so I had to buy the roughing version, but I have actually found uh, other roughing mills uh, that leave a really nice finish on the bottom. So uh, I thought I would give this a shot because it's really only the bottom finish that I'm concerned about. And that's the cutter there if you wanna give this guy a shot yourself. And within seconds of chucking up this cutter, I managed to snag my knuckle on it. It's not the cut that hurts. It's the betrayal. Tappy tap tap. So once again, I'm setting it up with the machinist jacks, but it should be more rigid in this orientation because the part is much, much wider this way. So I thought I'd do a little test cut here just to see what kind of finishes I can get on the bottom surface with this cutter. And that finishes so-so. So I won't be using this guy for finishing passes. As I said, I do have some other roughing mills that actually leave finish quality passes on the bottom surface. This turns out to not be one of them but it should be very efficient for the heavy material removal that I need to do here, but oh gosh, ah -heh. So here's the thing about a cutter this big on a mill this small, it is definitely possible to stall the spindle. That uh, two inch diameter is a lot of leverage on the motor. This is only a one horsepower mill, so I learned to be a little bit careful with the feed speed. It can take aggressive cuts, but the feed needs to be low enough that that cutter doesn't start digging in too far. Now my thought process at this point was, okay, I can do a single pass cut with this wider cutter on the short edges of the parts, and I have a ton of material here to remove. I have 500 thou to remove off of these 15 inch bars that are uh, almost an inch thick, and I got four of them to do. It's a lot of chips, so, so I'll do that in this setup, even though it's not the most rigid thing in the world because it's very convenient and surface finish doesn't matter, I just gotta get that material off of there, and then I'll come back with a better setup and do some finish passes. Speaking of being at the limits of my machines, this type of job is really where flood coolant would be the right choice, but I don't have that. All I've got is good old fashioned cutting oil brushed on and I brushed a lot of it on and uh, yeah, that filled the shop with smoke. So I was wearing a respirator and uh, it was yeah not uh, very pleasant generally. The first of that roughing done, I thought I'd uh, see how we did on dimension. So I left it about 30 thou large in case there's any taper or anything that we need to clean up. But uh, actually, this uh, came in within a thou uh, over the entire length, which really surprised me. I wasn't expecting my uh, budget hobby mill to hold a thousandth over a 24 inch pass, but uh, it did. Now they weren't all this good. I did have some taper on some. I think the worst I had about uh, 15 thou taper in one of them, but that's why I left them all large so that I could tune that up later with a better setup. More chips, more, more, too much. Here's another great shot where you can see the change in surface finish as it enters and leaves the vise. And this is, you know, a difference in support. This is basically down to the fact that I don't have clamps above clamping the material down onto the machinist jacks. Machinist jacks underneath alone really isn't enough support. There's nothing really stopping the part from vibrating. Okay, time to get serious and move these parts directly to the table. To do that, however, I'm gonna start by milling the end of this strap clamp. Why am I doing that? Well, this is why. These cheap strap clamps just have saw cut ends on them, and we're gonna use these as part of our clamping system on the front edge. So off comes the vise, and we'll clean everything up, make it all nice, and get ready to work with our parts directly on the table where we should have been doing this all along. These clean T-slots were brought to you by Keith Finner and the Barzy Summer Bash. 
couple of weeks ago I did a video on making some low profile side clamps for clamping material directly on the table while leaving the top surface fully exposed and now is their time to shine. So this is the project for which these clamps were designed and built. So I'm setting them up here with a square and then I'm using the ends of my strap clamps there as kind of a fixed jaw on the part and so that's why I wanted those machined properly on the ends. And so I clamp those guys in place and then I come back in and tighten up the set screws on my side clamps and we are ready to get down to business. This fancy cutter definitely paid for itself on this part of the job because we've got a three inch wide surface here that I need to bring down about a quarter of an inch and this is a lot of chips for my little mill but I was able to do 50 thou passes so two of those per pass for the top surface and in the surface finish I would say is adequate it's not outstanding but for a large roughing mill it's actually pretty decent now again my plan is to still come back and fly cut it anyway so I wasn't too worried about it at this stage after that first pass with the roughing mill, I decided to check up the fly cutter now and do a pass and just see how it's going to perform. And uh, the big question was whether it'll do a better job with the part clamped directly on the table than it was doing in the vise with that kind of uneven, inconsistent rigidity that we had. And the answer is yes, it did a much, much better job. The finish here is outstanding. So this is the approach I decided I would go with. I'm going to rough it with the roughing mill and then we'll come back and fly cut it. A little deburring with the Noga tool and let's take a closer look here so you can see the nice fly cut finish on the wide side and then that kind of rough finish on the edge that was left by the roughing mill and we'll come back and clean that up later. So then it's time to clean up our setup and flip the part over and do the same to the other side and it looks finished on this side but it actually isn't. This was the fly cutter finish that I wasn't very happy with. So I do a little uh, check with the depth micrometer at both ends just to see how much we have to remove. So remember that my plan was to rough these guys in with this fancy mill, leave them a few thou large, and then come back and fly cut them down to final dimension. But uh, look at these chips. See how they're all yellow and some are even blue and purple? That should be a sign of the rookie mistake that I'm about to make. I've finished the roughing on this first part. We're aiming for 750. I'm a skitch over 751 on this end and a skitch over 752 on this end. So, so far so good. We got a thou left to fly cut and Bob's your uncle, right? Well, remember those chips. You know what that means? This part was hot, very hot. It was so hot that I actually had to let it cool off before I could handle it. And after these parts sat on the bench for a while and I went back to fly cut them, they were all actually right on dimension or slightly under. So the parts shrank. The good news is my parts are all on dimension. The bad news is if I want to improve this finish without dramatically altering the dimension, I have to break out the emery paper. Now again, these finishes are okay. They're probably adequate for the parts, but I just wasn't happy with them. I wanted them to be nicer than this. So I spent some quality time with emery paper and uh, I was able to improve it a lot. Uh, the looks didn't really improve. It's hard to fix that once the tool marks are there, but they feel very, very smooth. So even though they don't look as nice as the fly cutting, they are smooth to the touch. It's what you might call a lights off finish, but hey, it has a great sense of humor. Next, it's time to take care of those short edges and get them down to dimension and clean up the finish. So I set up some one, two, three blocks as kind of a makeshift fence, and I just squared things up woodworker grade with a square. We're just cutting the entire top surface, so the uh, absolute squareness of the part to the table doesn't really matter. And I'm using some C-clamps on the ends with some brass shims to protect the finish. And I got out two of my little side clamps again to hold the center area there at the back. And then I used this Niagara cutter that always gives me a good finish and I did two passes on each side of each of the remaining edges and I also used this cutter to take the last uh, 15 or 20 thou off that I had. Allow me to wax mysterious for a moment about these budget 123 blocks that we all buy. They have 3816 threaded holes in them which should be great because it's the same as my strap clamp hardware but those holes don't seem to actually be useful for much. I have on occasion used them as a makeshift machinist jack, and they're okay for that. What really grinds my gears though is that the unthreaded holes should be clearance drilled for 3 16 hardware so that you could through bolt them into the T-nuts of the same thread pitch, but they're not. They're too small for that. Why? What are those holes good for if I can't bolt them into my T-nuts? I've considered drilling them out, but uh, there isn't a lot of material inside them either, and I don't know how hard they are, although considering what they cost, they're probably not that hard. Eh, you get what you pay for, I guess. Anyway, that's why I'm using strap clamps on things that have a whole lot of holes in them that look like they could be bolted through. And more deburring, and rinse and repeat for the rest of the blocks. 
The next task is to square up the ends and bring the overall length of each bar down to dimension. So I'm going to tear down my one, two, three block setup, clean everything up, and I'm going to bring in my angle plate. I'm going to do this end squaring on the table, even though this would actually be just fine in the vise, but I wanted to try doing it on the table just for fun. So I indicated in the angle plate here, and then I bolted some one, two, three blocks to the angle plate to serve as a bottom surface. I wanted to get the bars up near the top edge of the angle plate so that the uh, spindle on the mill wouldn't interfere. Space was tight back here, but luckily a lifetime of working on British cars has given me all manner of weird and exotic wrenches like these little stubbies. And a quick check to make sure that the one, two, three blocks are on the same level, and they are, so we can set up our bar now. Got a machinist jack at one end there and then I'm gonna hold it down with a strap clamp on the top. And again, this could definitely be done in the vise. I just wanted to do it on the table for fun to, you know, experiment with different techniques for setup. And away we mill. And this was going really, really great. Super fun, really happy with this setup. Gonna be doing all the bars this way. And I ran out of Y-axis travel. 1930s steam-powered fist shake. Shh. Okay, okay, I cried uncle, put the vise back on set up the bar like I should have all along and put a little jack on the back for support and then just face the ends. Once I have the ends cleaned up, it's time to establish the overall length. This is a little tricky. I don't have precision measuring instruments that are 14 inches long and this is even too long for my DRO to measure because of how it's positioned on the table. So I'm going old school here and I'm using layout and a scriber and uh, I'm gonna bring it down to that line. When I think I'm close, I use an end stop on one end for the ruler, and then I use the parallel there, which has a sharp edge on it and will register cleanly on the numbers on the ruler, and then some magnification and good light allows me to see. And if I'm within the thickness of the marking on that ruler, then I can be confident that I'm within the 10 thou tolerance that we have on the length of this part. But then I set up an end stop and zeroed out the DRO, and now I can just mill the other three bars down to this same length. I was a bit too paranoid with the saw cuts, so some of them, like this guy, are 368 thou long, and so I had a lot of side milling to do, but actually this Niagara cutter did great with pretty aggressive side milling passes, so it didn't take very long. Last job is to drill those big holes, so I'm edge finding here to establish one corner, and then I move the DRO to where the first hole should be, and a little bit of sanity check with the machinist ruled because, well, I'm a little paranoid at this point. I've got a lot of work in these parts, so a stupid mistake now would be really, really painful. So I center drill all of these holes, and then I come back in with a 5 16 drill, just as kind of a pilot. And I work my way up in a couple of sizes. Once again, small mill problems. You can't drill too much too fast or you won't have the torque. The final dimension that we're aiming for here is 2130 seconds. And Keith Rucker talks about this a lot on his channel, that these really old machines used a lot of odd sizes for things. So I had to go out and buy this special Hertel 2130 seconds drill for the job. And San Dusky, that's a nice looking drill. It's a reduced shank drill, so it'll go nicely in a half inch collet. This mill is big enough that I can't absolutely stall the machine with it, as you see there. So I'm uh, having to baby it a little bit, but the end result was very nice indeed. Nice clean hole. And this shot shows you about the maximum uh, cut that you can take with a drill of this diameter on a mill like this. So this, that's about 100 thou per side on that hole. This was the moment where I would learn if my parallels would clear the largest size of the holes. And luckily they did, so I didn't have to reset my setup. And then the last thing I did was come back in with my zero flute chamfering tool and I set the depth stop on my quill to make the chamfers all the same. And once those were done, I flipped the part end for end to chamfer the other sides. Technically, I've lost some precision doing this because the edge finding was done on the opposite corner from the one that I'm now reckoning from for the other chamfers, but these are just chamfers, so absolute precision is not gonna be that important. Repeat that a bunch more times and there you go. Four crosshead guide bars for a 1930s era steam stoker engine destined for the 576 locomotive restoration at the Nashville Steam Preservation Society. Now all that's left to do is oil them for safekeeping, crate them up, and send them off to Keith who is going to install them in the engine as soon as he gets ready to do so. As of this recording, he's got a bunch more work to do on the casting yet before these are ready to go in. But I hope you enjoyed watching this video as much as I enjoyed making these parts. Maybe consider throwing me a couple bucks on Patreon, and we'll see you next time.